in the next module, we'll discuss how to formally address this issue of calibration in the framework of machine learning. So um, how does machine learning deal with this kind of um, estimation problem, parameter estimation? So machine learning is a field that is uh, by now rather well established. It's a sub branch of computer science and it's primarily consisting of lots of different algorithms, <laughs> hundreds of algorithms. Um, and it, most of these are in different schools and built under different assumptions like neural networks here and uh, fuzzy logic there or whatever. But ultimately, even though this is a very rich field with different kinds of methodologies, everything can be understood in a common framework. It's computer science, computer science just built frameworks. <laughs> so, and that is what makes, um, makes this very useful and um, makes methods and so on mutually exchangeable, for example, which is very practical. So, we say a machine learning method, uh, or most of them, consists of, of uh, especially the interesting ones for BCI, consists of two functions, a so-called training function and a prediction function. They are part of one story. The training function gets uh, a collection of, of examplers. Um, usually it's labeled examples in, in supervised learning. I'll say a few things. So these are basically these input-output pairs. And it generates a model that's a collection of parameters. So this is um, you know, the big error in our previous scheme. And the corresponding prediction function gets a new data exemplar, such as a new chunk of EEG, and the model from, from the training function, and it predicts the corresponding label. So um, it's, it's a mapping from data model onto label, and this is a mapping from multiple data and label examples onto a model. So, um, and, and these parameters basically capture the relationship between data and labels. So you can kind of formally say uh, data is, is a matrix of um, multiple vectors, you know, number of observations, number of, we call it features, and the labels are, um, is also a matrix, number of observations again, and then the dimensionality of the labels, for example, a number, a, a single scalar, so that would be then n by one. There is, um, as you see, this is based on uh, uh, on a discrete collection of exemplars, so or trials. So basically, machine learning is is in in stark contrast to signal processing, not really based on time series at all, or so. It's based on exemplars from which you learn, and based on which you predict. So um, uh, there's one more thing to say. Um, <laughs> the prediction function is usually very simple. And it, it might ju look just like the ones that we sketched in the previous lecture. The learning function is where most of the action happens. And that's usually, say, 10 times as complex as the prediction function. What we just described is one sub area, which is the most sort of applicable in machine learning to BCI. That's so-called supervised learning, where you have um, not only you know the, the EEG, but also the associated desired output uh, that the BCI should produce for this chunk, the label. Um, and there's other branches such as unsupervised learning where you don't have um, labels, you just know labels. You, all you have is data, and so all you can do is learn, say, how the data is distributed in, in space. You can say, well, um, this frequency content is more probable than that frequency content and things like that, or these kinds of source constellations are more probable than those, et cetera. And that gives rise to certain kinds of representations of, of the data itself. Um, but since the BCI needs to estimate some quantities, some specific quantity, we are mostly talking about supervised learning. And there's a bunch of other branches. There's semi-supervised learning where you have some labeled data and some unlabeled, that's useful. If labels are really hard to obtain, you can sort of um, have lots of fill on material that is easy to record, and a bunch of other frameworks that, that are beyond the scope of this lecture. But there's a schema such as what is called active learning, which is a way where the system decides what labels it wants to see next, such as 
um, I haven't seen enough data of the person being excited, give me more. <laughs> and then in some closed loop system, the person would be presented um, with more exciting pictures say. and other sophisticated things. But we will not manage to cover those in this lecture. But there's a good deal of literature on that. This, this area relates to various other areas. Primarily, it's about probability theory and statistics because it's, it's all associated with uncertainty. Your observations are all just samples of a much larger population. And you need to estimate um, you know, certain kinds of parameters under uncertainty. It's also related to optimization because the parameters that you ultimately come up with are, in some sense, supposed to be optimal given the data that you saw and given the assumptions that you had. And there is a bunch of more specific areas in, in machine learning, like, such as neural networks, which is a particular way to, f to set up a, a prediction function and an associated learning function and so on, and AI and these kinds of things. So when we now put this to use, um, machine learning, in the context of EEG and in the context of BCIs, what we usually say is for every target marker in the data, um, say the stimuli uh, S2 and S1, ignoring some others like responses or so, um, we extract a chunk of EEG around it, such as for this marker we extract, say, a chunk here, and for this marker we extract a chunk, and for that marker we extract a chunk. The markers encode the label, say the label is 2, 1, 1, because this was stimulus marker 2, stimulus marker 1, and so on. and um, and that's what we get from our data. So this is what the recording system produces. This is what we stick into machine learning. And so uh, we can sort of concatenate all this into a data matrix, uh, multiple observations, and all the labels into a label vector, also across all observations, stick it into the training function, get our model parameters, and get our model. So, um, and you can say that um, as I already indicated, the parameters are optimized such that the performance of the prediction function, when you apply it to that data, given this output that, is optimal um, under some assumptions, like whatever, um, the distribution of the data is smooth or something along those lines. So this is one way to view, to understand what this thing is actually doing. And we all see this. Uh, in, in much more detail in a second. There is only one thing, and that is um, this chunk of data that you give it is, this might be 100 time points, it might be 128 channels or so, that's 10,000 of numbers um, in there in a single observation. And so if you're learning a mapping from that onto the output, you have thousands of degrees of freedom. And so you need lots of bits of information, in a sense, to constrain these, these numbers, these parameters. And usually, um, if you take an off-the-shelf machine learning method, such as support vector machines or so, they, um, let's say there's, there's just too much to learn from too few exemplars. It's not constrained enough. The models don't um, have any domain-specific assumptions in your support vector machines. doesn't know anything about EEG, for example. And so you cannot effectively constrain the solution space and so on. So you need to do something extra to do really well with off-the-shelf methods. And that extra step is called feature extraction. It's, you can say it's a way of reducing the dimensionality of the data. Um, so the idea is you take a chunk of EEG and you identify certain key features that you think are relevant for what you are trying to predict, such as, I think it's spectral processes, so let's do a spectral transform. And I think it's only 10 hertz, so let's just extract 10 hertz amplitude. And I think phase is irrelevant, so we throw phase away. And so you've reduced something from, say, 100 channels times whatever, how many time points, to 100 numbers. And that is where neuroscience factors in, where all the prior knowledge factors in, um, where you can um, really simplify the problem and make it tractable for off-the-shelf methods. What you also might do is transform the data in such a way that the statistical distributions are sort of more um, easy to deal with or so. I show you an example for that. Um, so here's a simple uh, example for, uh, for feature extraction. If 
first and foremost, as I said, they, they're sort of informed by the process you're trying to ex that you're trying to get at. And so for oscillations, for example, you can take the variance of the signal in a frequency band or so. That would be a feature. It kind of relates to the amplitude. Or the logarithm of that, because um, logarithm of the variance, in a sense, is more Gaussian <laughs> than the variance itself, uh, because the variance is a square in there. Um, or you know, parts of the Fourier spectrum of the data, these would be some valid features. Or if you have a so-called uh, an event-related potential, as we briefly touched on in a second lecture, you could say, um, in my chunk of EG, I have a peak somewhere. And the peak has a bunch of parameters, like the latency, the amplitude of the peak, and say the width of the peak. This is rather constructed, but it would be features. You know, it's three numbers that characterize a long time series, um, and, and a bunch of others. And so that, um, that's sort of the minimal intro to the machine learning framework, and it'll get concrete um, in the next section.